Chapter 26 The Second Task You said you already worked out the, that egg clue, said Hermione indignantly. Keep your voice down, said Harry crossly. I just need to sort or find turn it all right. He Ron, and Hermione were sitting at the very back of the charms class with a table to themselves. They were supposed to be practicing the opposite of the summoning, uh, summoning charm today, the banishing charm. Owing to the potential for nasty accidents when object kept fly flying across the room, Professor Flitwick had given each student a stack of cushions on which to practice, the theory being that these wouldn't hurt anyone if they went off target. It was a good theory, but it wasn't working very well. Neville's aim was so poor that he kept accidentally sending much heavier things flying across the room. Pro Professor Flitwick, for instance. Just forget the egg for a minute, all right, Harry hissed as Professor Flitwick when wheeling, wheezing resignedly past them, landing on top of a large cabinet. I'm trying to tell you about Snape and, and Moody. This class was ideal cover to, for a private conversation as everyone was having far too much fun to pay them any attention. Harry been recounting his adventure of the previous night in whispered installments for the last half an hour. Snape uh, said Moody searched his office as well, Ron whispered, his eyes all right with his interest as he banished a curious with a sweep of his wand. It soared into the air and knocked Parvitz's head off. What do you reckon, Moody's here to keep an eye on Snape as well as Karkarov? Well, I don't if that what Dumbledore asked him to do, but he definitely doing it, said Harry, waving his wand without paying much attention so that his cushion did an odd sort of belly slope of the desk. Moody, said Dumbledore, only let Snape stay here because he's given him a second chance or, or something. What? said Ron. Harry, maybe Moody thinks Snape uh, put your name in the goblet of fire? Oh, Ron, said Hermione, sh uh, shaking her head skeptically. We thought Snape was trying to kill Harry before and turn out he was saving Harry's life, remember? She banished a cushion and it flew across the room and landed in the box. They were all supposed to be aiming it. Harry looked at Hermione thinking. I don't care that Moody says, Hermione went on. Dumbledore's not stupid. He was right to trust Hagrid and Professor Lupin. Even though lots of people wouldn't have given them jobs, so why should he be right about Snape, even if Snape is a bit? Evil, said Ron promptly. Come on, Hermione, why are you these dark wizard catchers searching his office then? Why has Mr. Crouch been pretending to be ill, said Hermione, ignoring Ron. It's a bit funny. Isn't it that he can't manage to come to Hugh's ball, but he can get up there, here, in the middle of the night when he wants to? You just do, don't like Crouch because of the, that elf wind? said Ron, sending a cushion sorting into the window. You just want to think Snape's 
up to something, said Hermione, sending her cushions zooming neatly into the box. I just want to know what Snape did with his first uh, chance, if he's on his second one, said Harry grimly. Obedient to Sirius' wish of hearing about anything or to at Hogwarts, Harry sent him a letter by Brown all that night explaining all about Mr. Crouch breaking into Snape's office and Moody and Snape's conversation. Ron quite liked the idea of using the simoning charm again. Harry had explained about Aqualance and Ron couldn't see why Harry shouldn't summon one from the nearest muggle town. Harry squashed this plan by pointing on that, in the unlikely event that Harry managed to learn how to operate an Aqualon within the set limit of an hour, he was sure to be dis disqualified for breaking the International Court of Wizarding Secrecy. It was too much to hope that no muggles would spot an aqualon zooming across the countryside to Hogwarts. Of course, the idea solution uh, would be for you to transfigure yourself into a submarine or something, she said. If only we had done human transfiguration already, but I don't think we start that until six year, and it can go badly wrong if you don't know what you're doing. Yeah, I don't fancy walking around with a periscope sticking out of my head, said Harry. I suppose I could always attack someone in front of M Moody. He might do it for me. I don't think he'll let you choose what you wanted to be turned into, thought, said Hermione. Seriously, no, I think your best chance is some sort of charm. So Harry thinking that he would some have soon have had enough of the library to last his a lot time bury himself once more among the dusty volumes looking for any spell that might enable a human to survive without oxygen. However, thought he, Ron and Hermione searched through their lunch times, evenings and whole weekends through Harry asked Professor McGonagall for a note of permission to use a rectangular section and even asked the irritable vo like librarian Madam Pins for help they found nothing whatsoever that would enable Harry to spend an hour underwater and live to tell the tale. Familiar fluttering of panic were star starting to disturb Harry now, and he was finding it difficult to concentrate in lessons again. The lake which Harry had always taken for granted as just another feature of grounds drew his eyes whenever he was near a classroom window, a great iron gray mass of chilly water whose dark and icy depths were staring at to seem as distant the moon. With two days left, Harry started to go off food again. The only good thing about breakfast on Monday was the return of the black, black of brown of the brown oval had sent to Sirius. He pulled off the parchment and rolled it and saw the shortest letter Sirius had ever written to him. Send date of next hog hogmeet weekend to return by return oval. Harry turned the parchment we uh, over and Look at the back, hoping to see something else, but it was blank. Weekend after next, whispered Hermione, who had read 
the note over Harry's shoulder. Here, take my quill and send this owl back straight away. Harry scribbled the date down on the back of Sirius' letter, tied it back onto the brown owl legs and watched it like fly again. What do you want to know about the next Hogsmeade? Weekend for Satron. Do not, said Harry dully. The momentary happiness that had flared inside him at the sight of the owl had died. Come on, care of magical creatures. Whether Hogwit was trying to make up for the blast ended scrutes of or because there were not only two scrutes left, or because he was trying to prove he could do nothing that Professor Grubbly plain could. Harry didn't know. Today he had managed to capture two unicorns. Foals. Unlike full grown unicorns, they were pure gold. Parvati and Lavender went into transport and even Pansy Pankinson had to work hard to conceal how much she liked them. Either tear spots than the adults, Hagrid told the class. They turned silver when they above. Two years old, they grow horns at urn for them go pure white till they are full grown round about seven. They are a bit more trusting when they are habis, uh, babies, not mind boys so much. And um, moving a bit, yep, can pat them if you want, give them a few of these sugar lumps. You okay, Harry? Hagrid muttered, moving aside slightly. Yes, said Harry. Just never, uh, said Hagrid. Bit, said Harry. Harry, said Hagrid, clapping a massive hand on his shoulder so that Harry's knees buckled under the weight. I'd been worried before I saw you take on the Content, but I know now. Yeah, you can do anything. Yeah, I'm sad. Yeah, mind her. I'm not worried at all. You're going to be fine. Got your glue work out, haven't you? Harry nodded, but even as he did so, an incense argue arch to confess that. He didn't have any idea how to survive at the bottom of the lake for an hour came over him. He looked up at Hagrid, perhaps he had to go into the lake sometimes to deal with uh, the creature in it. Here, going to win Hagrid rolled patting Harry's shoulder again so that Harry actually found himself sink a couple of in inches into the muddy round. I know it. I can feel it. You're going to win Harry. By the evening before the second task, Harry felt as though he was trapped in the nightmare. He, Ron and Hermione sat in the library as the sun sat outside, tearing fer feverishly through page after page of spells hiding from each other by the massive piece of book on the desk in front of each of them. Harry's heart gave a huge leap every time he saw the word waiter on a page, but more often than not is merely take two points of water, half a pound of shirt mandrake leaves and a newt. I don't reckon it can be done, said Rons. There must be something, Hermione muttered, moving a candle closer to her. 
They never have said a task that was undoable. They have, said Ron. Harry, just go down to the lake tomorrow, right? Stick your head in it. Yelling at the mer people to give back whatever you whatever they nicked and see if they chuck it out. Best you can do it, mate. There is a way of doing it, Hermione said crossly. There just has to be. She seemed to be talking the library's lack of useful information on the subject as a personal insult. It had never failed her before. I know what I should have done, said Harry, resting face down on saucy trick of poor tricky sort. I should have learned to be an enig enigmanus like serious. Yeah, you could turn into a goldfish any time you wanted, said Ron. Or a frog, yawned Harry. He was exhausted. It takes years to become an enigmagus. Enigmagus. And then you have to register yourself and everything, said Hermione Vajotsi. Professor McGonagall told us, remember, you you are got to register yourself with an improper use of magic office. What animal you become and what markings. You so you can't absolute it. Hermione, I was joking, said Harry. I know I haven't got a chance of turning into a frog by tomorrow morning. Oh, this is no use, Hermione said, snapping real wizard's dilemmas shut. Who on earth wants to make their nose hair grow into ringlets? I wouldn't mind, said Fred Willis voice. Be a taking, talking point, wouldn't it? Harry Rand and Hermione looked up. Fred and George had just emerged from behind some bookshelves. What are you two doing there? Ron asked. Looking for you, said George Mag McGonagall. Wants you, Ron, and you, Hermione. Why? said Hermione, looking surprised. Mm, then, uh, she was looking at bit grim thought, said Fred. You are supposed to take you down to her office, said George. Ron and Hermione stared at Harry, who left his stomach drop. Well, I'll meet you back in, in the common room, Hermione told Harry. Bring as many of these books as you can, okay? Right, said Harry, Harry uneasily. By eight o'clock, Madame Pinks had ex uh, extinguished all the lamps and came to chivy Harry out of the library, struggling under the weight of as many books as he could carry. Harry returned to the Gryffindor common room, pulled a table into a corner and continued to search. Crookshan scrolled into Harry's lap and curled up pouring deeply. The common room emptied slowly around Harry. People kept wishing him luck for the next morning in cheery, confident voices like Hagrid's, all of them apparently convinced that he was about to pull off another stunning performance like the ones he had managed in the first task. Harry couldn't answer them. He just nodded, feeling as though there was a golf ball stuck in his throat. It's over, he told himself. You can't do it. You'll just have to go down to the lake in the morning and tell the judge. He imagined himself explaining that he couldn't do the task. He pictured Bagman's look of round eyes, surprise. Karkorov satisfied yellow toothed smile. Forgetting that Crookshanks was on his lap, Harry stood up very suddenly. Crookshanks hissed angrily as he landed on the floor, 
gave a hairy disgust look and stalked away with his bottle brush tail in the air, but Harry was already hurrying up the spiral staircase to the dormitory. Lumos, Harry whispered fifteen minutes later as he opened the library doors. One in the morning, two in the morning, the one way he could keep going was to tell himself over and over again, next book, in the next book, the next one. The mermaid in paintings in the perfect bathroom was laughing. Come. Harry was uh, bobbing like a cork of in bubbly water next to the rocky rock while she held the, his uh, firebolt over his head. Come and, come and get it, she giggled maliciously. Come on, jump. I can't, Harry panted. Give it to me. But she just poked him painfully in the side with the end of the bathroom laughing at him. If it hurts, get off. Ouch. Harry Potter must wake up, sir. Stop poking me. Dobby must poke Harry Potter, sir. He must wake up. Harry opened his eyes. He was still in the library. The invisibility cloak had slipped off his head she hit, she, uh, as he slept, and the sight of his face was stuck of, to the pages of where there weren't there's a way. Harry Potter needs, a, needs to hurry, squeaked Dobby. The second task starts in ten minutes, and Harry Potter... Ten minutes? Harry croaked. Ten? Ten minutes? He looked down at his watch. Harry, Harry Potter, squeaked Dobby, plugging at Harry's sleeve. You is supposed to be down to the lake with the other champion, Seal. It's too late, Dobby, Harry said hopelessly. I'm not going to. T uh, I'm not go doing the task. I don't know how. Harry Pop. Harry Potter will do the task. Squared the elf. Dobby knew Harry had not found the right book, so Dobby did it for him. What? Said Harry. But you don't know what the second task is. Dobby knows, Sir Harry Potter, has to go into the lake and find the wheezy. Find me, find my what? And take the wheezy, his wheezy, back from the mer people. What's a wheezy? Your wheezy, Sir, your wheezy, wheezy, who is giving Dobby his jumper? What? Harry gasped. They've got, they got. Ron, the thing Harry Potter will miss more, most serious quick Dobby and pass an hour. The prospect black, Harry risky. Too late, it's gone, it come back. Dobby, what, how am I got to do? You have to eat this serious quick elf right before you go into the lake, seer. Jilly wee. What it do, said Harry, staring at the gilded. It make Harry Potter breeze under water, sir. Dobby ha said Harry frantically, frantically. Listen, are you sure about this? He couldn't quite forget that the last time Dobby had tried to help him, he had ended up with no bones in his right arm. Dobby is quite sure, sir, said the elf. Earnest, and earnestly, Dobby hears things. Seer, he's a house elf. He goes all over the castle as the lights, the fires, and mops the floors. Dobby heard Professor McGonagall and Professor Moody in the staff room, talking about the next task. Dobby cannot let Harry, Harry Potter loose. His wheezy. Harry's doubts 
vanished, jumped to his feet, he pulled off the invisibility cloak stuffed into his bag, grabbed the jilvis and put it into his pocket, then tore all out of the library with Dobby at his heels. Dobby is supposed to be in the kitchen, sir, Dobby squealed as they her burst into the corridor. Dobby will be missed. Good luck, Harry Potter, sir. Good luck. See you later, Dobby, Harry shouted, and he sprinted around along the corridor and down the stairs, three at the time. The entrance hall contained a few last-minute struggle, all leaving the great hall after breakfast and heading through the double of doors to watch the second task. As he pounded down the lawn, he saw the seeds and had wriggled dragon, the dragon's and closure in November were now ranged along the opposite bank, rising in stands that were packed to bursting point and the flat in the lake below. He, uh, uh, he uh, the excited bubble of crowd etched strangely across the water as Harry ran flat out around the other side of the lake towards the judges you, who were sitting at another gold drapes table at the water's edge. Sajid, Fleur and Crumb were beside the judge's table, watching Harry spin towards them. I'm here, said um, Harry panted, getting to a halt in the mud. The accidentally spluttering fluid floor ropes. Where are you? Where have you been? said a bossy, disproving voice. The talk about the start. Harry looked around. Percy Weasley was sitting at the judge's table. Mac Grouch had failed to turn up again. Now, now, Percy, said Ludo Bugman. Was looking interestedly, intensively relieved to Harry. Let him catch his breath. Dumbledore smiled at Harry. But Karkarov and Madame Maxim didn't look at all pleased to see him. It was obvious from the looks on their faces that they had thrown through he wasn't going to turn. Harry bent over, hand, hands on, the, on his knees, gasping for breeze. He had a stitch in his sight that felt as though he had a knife between his ribs, but there was no time to get rid of it. Luther Bagman was now moving among the champions, pacing them along the bank at intervals of ten feet. Harry was on the very end of the line next to Crumb, was who was wearing swimming trunks and was holding his wand ready. All right, Harry, Bagman, twis Bagman whispered. As he moved Harry a few feet further away from Crumb, now what you are going to do? Yeah, Harry panted, sensing his right. Well, all our champions are ready for the second task, which will start on my whistle. They have preciously an hour to recover what has been taken from them. On the count of three, then one, two, three, whispering shots chilly in the cold still air. The lake was so cold, he felt the skin on his legs steaming as though this was fire, no, uh, not icy water. His so sudden ropes weighted him down as he walked in deeper. Now the water was over his knees and his rapidly numbing heat feet were slipping over seats, sealed and flat, slimy stones.
he could had luck in the crowd and he knew he must look stupid walking into the lake without showing any sign of magical power. He avoided looking at the stands. His laughter beca was becoming louder and there were catcalls and jeering from the Slytherins. <clears throat> then, quite suddenly, Harry felt as though an invisible pillow had been clapped over his mouth and nose. Harry clapped his hands around his robe and felt two large slits just below his ears flappy in the cold air. He had gills. The first gulp of icy lake water felt like the breeze of life. His head were, had stopped spinning. He took another great gulp of water and felt it pass smoothly uh, through his gills, sending oxygen back to his brain. He twisted around and looked at his bar feet. They had become enlarged and his toes were webbed too. It looked as though he had sprouted flippers. The water didn't feel icy anymore either. On the contrary, he felt pleasantly cool and very light. Harry stuck out once more, marveling at how far and fast his slipper-like feet propelled him through the water and uh, noticing no, how clearly he could see and how he no longer need to blink. Silence pressed upon his ears and he saw over a strange dark foggy landscape he could only see ten, see ten far feet around him. He swam deeper and deeper, all toward the middle of the lake, his eyes wide, staring through the easy gray light water around him to the shadows beyond where the water became opaque. Small fish flickered past him like silver darts. Light green weed stretched ahead of uh, him as far as he could see, two feet deep, like a needle of very overgrown grass. Harry was sta uh, staring unblinkly ahead of him, trying to discern shapes through the gloom, and then, without warning, something gave a hold of his ankle. Harry twisted his body around and saw a Grindelow, a small born water demon poking out of the weeds, its long fingers clutched tightly around uh, Harry's leg, its pointed fangs. Thanks, Bert. Harry stuck his webbed hand quickly inside his robes and fumbled for his wand. By the time he had grasped it, two more green jillows and had risen out of the weed, had scythes and hoods of Harry's ropes and were attempting to drag him down. Rashello, Harry shouted. Harry slowed down a little, slipped his one back inside his ropes and looked around, listening again. He turned full cir circle in the water, the silence pressing harder than ever against his eardrums. He knew he must have been even deeper in the lake now, but nothing was moving except the ripping weed. How are you getting on? Harry thought he was having a heart attack. He whipped around and saw morning Myrtle. Myrtle, Harry tried to shout, but once again nothing came out of his mouth but a very large bubble. Morning motor actually giggled. You want to try over me, she said, pointing. I won't come with you. I don't like them much. They always chase me when I get close. He swam on for what felt like at least 20 minutes. He was passing over 
waist expanses of black mud now. Harry swam faster and soon saw a large rock emerge out of a muddy water. It had paintings of more people on it. Harry swam on past the rock full following the mare song. A cluster of crowd songs dwelling stain with algae bloomed suddenly out of the gloom on all sides. The mer people sa had uh, grayish skins and long white dark green hair. Their eyes were yellow as were their broken teeth and they were th uh, thick ropes of pebble round their necks. Harry speed on, turned round and Soon the dwarves became more numerous. There were gardens of wheat around of, of them, and he even saw a pet grindelow. My people were emerging on all sides now, watching him eagerly, pointing at his webbed hands and gills. A whole crowd of my people were floating in the front of house that lined what looked like a mere version of village square. Four people were bound tightly to the tail of the stone mare person. Ron was tied between Hermione and Cho Chang. There was also a girl who looked no older than eight. Harry felt sure that she was Fleur Dalador's sister. Harry speed towards the host grace, half expecting mere people to lower their spears and change at him, charge at him. But they did nothing. The ropes of wheat uh, tying to hostages to the statue were thick, slimy, and very strong for fleeting seconds through of the knife Sirius had bought, brought him for Christmas looked at his trunk in the castle a quarter of a mile away. No use. To him, whatever he looked around, we don't help," said uh, he in a rush, crockly voice. "Come on," said Harry f fiercely. Harry swirled around, staring about something sharp, anything. So Harry looked around. There was no sign of any of the other champions. What? Where they playing at? Why didn't they hurry up? At once, several pairs of uh, strong grey hands seized him. Half a dozen Mormon were pulling him away from Hermione, shaking their green hair hats and laughing. You take your own hostage, one of them said to him. Leave the others. No way, said Harry furiously. Your task is to retrieve your own friend. Leave the other. She's my friend too, Harry yelled. And I don't want them to die either. Choose head was on Hermione's shoulder. The small, feeble-haired girl was ghostly green and pale. Harry struggled to fight out the moment, but they laughed harder than ever, holding him back. Harry looked wild around. But then the more people around him started pointing exactly over his head. Harry looked up and saw Cedric swimming towards them. There was an enormous bubble around his head, which made his feature look oddly white and stretched. Got lost, he mouthed, looking panic stricken, Fleur and Cromer, Cromer going now. Feeling enormously relieved, Harry watched Cedric pull a knife out of his pocket and cut Cho free. He pulled her upwards out of the side. The mer people started screeching ex excitedly, though holding Harry loose knit their group staring behind him. He appeared to have transfi transfigured himself, but badly. The sharp man swam straight to Hermione and began snapping and biting at her ropes.
Harry hit Crumb hard on the shoulder and held up the juggled stone. Crumb sized it and began to cut Hermione free. Now what? Harry thought uh, desperately. If he could be sure that Fleur was coming, but still no sign. There was nothing for it. Harry pulled on his wand. Get out of the way. Only bubbles flew out of his mouth, but he had uh, the distinct impression f that the mermen had understood him because they suddenly stopped laughing. You got until there, Harry shouted. A great stream of bubble burst from him, but the held up three fingers made sure they got the message. One, two, they uh, scattered. Harry darted forward and began to hack the ropes, binding, binding the small girl to the statue, and at least she was free. It was very slow work. He could no longer use his webbed hands to propel himself forward. He worked his flippers furiously, but Ron and Fleur's sister were like potato filled sacks, dragging him him back down. He fixed his eyes skyward through. He knew he must still be very deep. The water about him was so dark. More people was rising with him. He could see them swirling around him with ease watching him struggle through water. He was drawing breath with extreme difficulty. He was he could feel pain on the side of his neck again. He kicked hard with flippers and discovered that they were nothing more than feet. He had to get there. He had to. Harry kicked his leg so hard and fast it felt as though his muscles were screaming in protest. He, his very brain felt waterlogged. He couldn't breathe, he need oxygen. And then he felt his his head break the surface of the lake. Wonderful, cold, clear air making his wet face stream. All around him wild green haired had heads were emerging out of the water with him, but they were smiling at him. The crowd in the stands was making a great deal of noise, shouting and screaming. Everybody seemed to be on their feet. Harry had the impression they thought that Ron and the little girl might be dead, but they were wrong. So Harry said, What? This, this isn't it? Then he spotted Flu's sister. What did you bring? Her for? Fleur didn't turn. I couldn't leave her. Harry panted. Harry, you prat, said Ron. You didn't take that son thing seriously, did you? Dumbledore wouldn't have let any of us drown. But the song said, only to make sure you got back inside the time limit, said Ron. I hope you didn't waste time down there acting the hero. Come on, Harry said Charlie. Shortly, help me with her. I don't think she can swim very well. Harry could see Madame Pomfrey uh, fussing over Hermione, Crown, Cedric and Cho, all whom were wrapped in thick blankets. Dumbledore and Ludo Bagman stood beaming at Harry and Ron from the bank as they swam nearer, but Percy, who looked very white and somehow much younger than usual, came splashing out to meet him. Meanwhile, Madame Maxim was trying to re restrain Fleur Delacour, for it was quite historical fighting tooth and nail to return to the water. Gabriel, Gabriel, is she alive? Is she hurt? She's fine, Harry tried to tell her. 
it was the Grindelows. They take me. Oh, Gabriel, I thought, I thought. Come here, you, said Madame Pomfrey's voice. Harry, well done, Hermione cried. You did it. You found out how. All by yourself. Well, said Harry. Yeah, that's right, said Harry, raising his voice slightly. The Karkarov could hear him. You have a water beetle in your hair, Hermione. Um, Hermon Nini said Crumb. Harry had the impression that Crumb was drawing her attention onto himself, perhaps to remind her that he had just rescued her from the lake. But Hermione brushed the beetle away impatiently and said, You're well outside the time limit through Harry. Did it take you ages to find us? Now I find you okay. Harry's feeling all stupidly was growing. Why hadn't he just dropped Ron and, and gone? Cedric and Crumb hadn't wasted time worrying about anyone else. They hadn't taken the Merson seriously. Dumbledore was crouching at the water's edge deep in conversation with what seemed to be the chief mer person, uh, particularly wild and ferocious uh, looking female. Finally, he straightened up, turned to his fellow judges and said, a conference before we give the marks, I think. Look after Gabriel, said Madame Prophy, Prophy, uh, Pomfrey. And then she turned to Harry. You say her, uh, she said breathlessly. Even though she was not your hostage. Yes, said Harry, who was now heartily wishing he left all three girls tied to the statue. Lou bent down his Harry twice on each cheek. The, then said Ron, and you too, you helped. Yes, yeah, said Ron, looking extremely hopeful. Yeah, a bit. Ladies and gentlemen, we have reached our decision. Uh, Merchant Flayton Marcus was, has told us exactly what happened at the bottom of the lake, and we had therefore decided to award marks out of 50 for each of the champion as follows. Miss Fleur Delacour thought the demon straighted excellent use of the bubble head charm was tracked uh, by Grindelow's uh, as they approach her goal and failed to retrieve her hostage. He, we offered her 25 po points. Applause from the stands. I deserved zero. Said Fleur so, uh, throatly, shaking her mag mag magnificent head. Uh, Mr. Cedric Diggory, who also used the bubble heart charm, was first to return with the hostage. Through he returned one minute outside the time limit of an hour. Anonymous cheers from the Hufflepuffs in the crowd. Harry saw Chu give Cedric a glowing look. We therefore award him 47 points. Harry's heart sank. If Cedric had become outside the limit, the time limit, he most certainly had been. Mr. Victor Crumb used an un incomplete form of transfiguration, which was nevertheless effective and was second to return with his hostage. We award him 40 points. Kar Karkarov clapped particularly hard, looking very superior. Mr. Harry Potter used Gillivit to uh, great effect. Bagman continued. He returned last and well outside the time limit of an hour. However, the Merchie Fontaines informs us that Mr. Potter was first to reach the hostages and uh, that the delay in his return was due to determination to 
return all hostages safety, not merely his own. Ron and Hermione both gave Harry half expirated, half uh, commiserating looks. Most of the judge and here uh, Bagman gave Kerkaroff a very nasty look. Feel that this shows moral fiber and merits full marks. For, uh, however, Mr. Potter's score is 45 points. Harry's stomach leaped. He was now typing for first place with Sadduk. Ron and Hermione, caught by surprise, stared at Harry, then laughed and started applauding hard with the rest of the crowd. There you go, Harry, Ron shouted over the noise. You weren't being sick um, after all. You were showing moral fiber. fiber. Fleur was clapping very hard too, but Crumb didn't look very happy at all. He attempted to engage uh, Hermione in conversation again, but she was too busy cheering Harry to listen. The third and final task will take place at, uh, at dusk on the 24th June, continued Bagman. The champions will be no notified of what is coming preciously one month beforehand. Thank you all for your support of the champions. It was over. Harry thought dazedly as Madame Pomfrey uh, began herding, herding the champions and hostages back to the castle to get into dry clothes. It was over. He had got through. He didn't have to worry about anything now until June the 24th. Next time he was in the Hawks Middle meet Hogsmeade, uh, he decided as he walked up back uh, the stone steps into the castle, he was going to buy Dobby a pair of socks for every day of the year.